Um, science has made a remarkable discovery in the last century. It has found out that it cannot really describe the world. The reason is that there is a part of the world that we cannot see. It is non-empirical. Science is based on the thesis that by watching, by observing the world, we can understand it but you cannot see the non-empirical world. So the discovery has, in a way, pulled out the very basis of science from under its butt. <laughs> yes, science has a butt, and, and it doesn't smell good either. <clears throat> so um, yes, the visible world is Maya. It's, it's a system of tricky deceptions, like the commercials of a big company, or the statements of our government. Um, think, for example, about Isaac Newton. He said, in the beginning, God formed matter in solid, massy, hard, impenetrable par particles, so very hard as never to wear or break in pieces. At the same time, he wrote in Principia Mathematica, I have no need of hypothesis. So how can it be that somebody talks about how God created matter and at the same time thinks he has no need for hypothesis? Maya means that inspired minds were often misled by their own discoveries. Newton's physics was materialism. <clears throat> Everything is explained in terms of material particles. The particles are eternal, they never break break in pieces. Nature is, nature is eternal. So there was no room for anything spiritual and mental. Everything is explained in terms of the properties of particles. Um, <clears throat> there's something very interesting about language. Our language washes our brain. What what do you say, for example, in, in English when you want to say um, something is unimportant? It doesn't matter. If it's not matter, it doesn't matter. But what would you say in Dutch? Pan? Yeah, it's different. In other words, the Dutch language pre-programs you much less for materialism than the English. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the most powerful formulations of materialism come out of the English language range. It's Newton's physics and Darwin's biology. And maybe the banking system. Yeah, but that's a... <laughs> we don't know about this. We'll not talk about that. <laughs> what do you say in English when when something is empty, like you have a box, it's empty, what do you say? Nothing. There's nothing, no thing. What if there is no thing but it isn't empty because it is filled with invisible forms? And as we see, that is what quantum theory tells us about the world. It is filled with invisible forms in the background of the visible world. It's nothing fancy. In, in a few seconds, you will see. Reality. Where does it come from? It comes from Latin, rays, things. Things are real. There is no other English word for reality. In German, there are two. Realität is the same. Comes from rays. And Wirklichkeit. Wirklichkeit comes from acting, wirken. It doesn't have to be a thing, but it can act on you. It's real. So, you know, sometimes people meet and say, OK, let's discuss our issues in an objective way. They cannot really. They can only be objective to the extent of 
the permission of their language. It's, it's a very important point. <clears throat> so um, Newton's materialism, of course, it was immensely successful. Think of the technological consequences, so on. And so Darwin entered it into biology. And then <clears throat> having or not having staff became the essence of life. And greed and aggression became the virtues of our society. It's logical. It's a natural order. <clears throat> Quantum physics has put an end to this. In the last century, Werner Heisenberg declared the end of materialism. He said <clears throat> modern atomic theory no longer allows any naive materialistic concept of the universe. Atoms, elementary particles, aren't really material particles. In a few seconds, you will see <clears throat> why he said this. But in general, quantum physics says the basis of the world is non-material. There is a part we can't see, but it is real, part of reality. It is real. We can't see it because it doesn't consist of things, doesn't consist of stuff, but of forms. Why are the forms real? because they have the potential to act on us. They can act on us. They form a realm of potentiality. Actually, all empirical things are emanations out of such a realm. Material particles emanate out of a realm of waves. And waves, they are patterns of information. So you see already come out this idea of patterns of information. Information is normally for some mind. It's a cosmic realm of information, cosmic mind. And more and more of these items come out, and they aren't stupid. <coughs> Excuse me. So, yes, you see, we are not going to, and you don't have to talk about fancy stuff. There are lots of fancy phenomena, and if you are not a physicist, you don't understand them, and you say, okay, hell with it, or whatever. There are some very simple things that show you, for example, that there is a part of the world that is non-material. The basis is non-material. Like, you know, atoms, <clears throat> that's very simple. Uh, they have a nucleus. Nucleus contains 99.99% of the mass. It is about 10,000 times smaller than the size of an atom. What is the size of an atom? Is when another atom enters that range, there is a repulsive force. So, you know, as a consequence, this is empty. It's empty stuff. Because a nucleus is, yeah, is 10,000 times smaller than the, the size of an atom. If we could take all the nuclei of all the atoms in this globe and put them together, you know what kind of area we would fill? The European fashion, fashion the football field. Nobody would play football. <laughs> the rest is empty. Actually, it isn't completely empty. It is filled with potentiality. It was really, it's really a consequence of Schrodinger's quantum mechanics. Schrodinger's quantum mechanics <clears throat> is the only way to understand the properties of atoms and molecules. In this theory, the electrons in atoms, they are not particles. They are, they are waves. When an electron enters an atom, it becomes a wave, not a material wave, because these waveforms in Schrodinger's physics, they don't have units of matter or energy. They are just numbers. They're forms. The electrons become a form. So it's like an electron has two states. It can appear as a particle. When we see it, it's always a localized particle. And you leave it alone, it becomes a wave. And then, you know, physicists, 
they kind of wrestle with this and say it's a wave particle duality. Bologna. There's no duality. It's like water can be liquid, you drink it, it can be ice. We don't speak of the water, liquid, ice duality. <laughs> there are two states, particle state, wave state. And the waves, they don't have units of energy. When this first became known, the physicist said, what the hell is going on here? Then it was Max Born who said, well, the meaning and the nature of these waves is they are probability waves. What would you see when you could crawl into an atom? Nothing. It's empty. Once in a while, whoop, there's an electron. Whenever you see it, it's a particle. Then it becomes a wave again. Repeated observations show us these waves. So, yes, um, Born, Max Born said there are probability waves. That's the meaning of these. Yeah, wait. What are probabilities? They're dimensionless numbers. They're just numbers. They're ratios of numbers. They're patterns of information. The visible order, even though they have no matter or energy, they determine the order of the world. The interaction of the waves of atoms determines what kind of molecules can form. The waveforms of molecules determine how they interact and, for example, how they keep you alive when they interact in your body. Conclusion is, visible reality is based on phenomena that transcend the materialism of classical physics. Atoms are empty. So, <clears throat> the electrons in atoms are numbers. There's this wonderful phenomenon, perennial philosophy. Of course, already the Indian sages discovered it and <clears throat> called it something like Sanatana Dharma, all-pervading truth. There are truths that are so deep and so general that they are constantly coming back again and again over thousands of years in different people, in different parts of the world. So, <sighs> The idea that, that electrons are numbers or things are numbers is such an idea. For example, Pythagoras already said all things are numbers. Big deal, that's what he meant. Nicolas de Cusa, um, a German monk, he said, number was the first model of things in the creator's mind. And then, of course, there's Plato, who said real atoms are not things. No, they are forms in some transcendent world. Those are the real atoms. So, it's interesting, you know, at this point to, to think perennial philosophy, does it mean, does it tell us something? For one thing, it shows us that ideas evolve. When the Greek philosophers said atoms are numbers or things are numbers, basically they said the same thing as, as quantum physics, but quantum physics has other implications in this number business. And secondly, ideas may recur in different people, different times, because perhaps our minds are connected to something. It's an idea to think about. So, uh, a second perennial concept, the existence of non-empirical, of a non-empirical background, okay? So, there is a realm in the world that we can't see, it consists of forms. The, invis the visible world is an emanation out of this realm. And here we can do something else. You see, we don't need fancy stuff. We can just look at the states of atoms and molecules. All atoms or molecules exist in states. That's easy to see. It's like 
an atom is like a, it's like a ladder. Many steps. Each step represents an amount of energy, a fixed amount of energy, a quantum of energy. It's a quantum state. So like you, when you take a ladder to climb on top of a roof, you go from step to step. Atoms and molecules are like this. They stand on a step. They occupy a state. The other states, they are empty. OK, so quantum chemists call the empty states virtual states. They exist in a system, but they call them virtual. Here's an example, the hydrogen atom. Um, don't worry about it. The states are in Schrodinger's a mechanism, they are defined by numbers. They, since they define quantum or energy, they are quantum numbers. Never mind. They define quantum states, and they define, for each state, a waveform. Each state has its own waveform. That determines, in this kind of physics, the property of this state. So, if a hydrogen atom exists in this state, it looks like a, like a ball. In another state, it may look like a, like a piece of cake or like a window of a Gothic cathedral or something. OK? Now, <clears throat> the point is, when the system is in one state, let's say in this one, the other forms also exist, but you can't see them because there's nothing there. If it exists in this form, you can repeat observations. You can get this form. But nothing is in the other states. If it jumps into this state, then you get a, then you get a sphere. But then all the others are invisible. So there is an order there that is, that is existent. It's part of the law. Yeah, I have to. I apologize, you know, this winter weather, I've been traveling in Europe for the last month, thinking of, of summer weather, and I didn't have clothes and so on, so it really got to, <laughs> to me. Didn't you have some beer for the, I mean, <laughs> oh, okay, well. So, um, these forms exist, they are virtual. All right. What are they? They are mathematical forms, they are patterns of information, but they are real. Because they have the potential to become visible, namely when the system jumps into them. You see how this is a very simple example of something non-visible but real? Um, What did I want to say? A virtual state's form a realm of potentiality. OK, we have said that. Um, the only thing that an atom or molecule can do is to jump into a virtual state. It cannot jump into nothing. So you know, right now, theories become popular, theories of nothing, like life evolves out of nothing. How stupid. Life evolves because systems have virtual states they can actualize. Or the universe came out of nothing. How stupid. It came out of a realm of potentiality that existed before it was visible. So <clears throat> actually, it was Aristotle who invented this, this concept of potentiality. Uh, he wanted to deal with a problem that Parmenides pointed out, Parmenides drove his contemporaries crazy by saying there can be no motion and there can be no change. He said, for example, if a thing changes, if something seems to come out of a thing, either what is coming out of there already exists, so it didn't come into being, or it came out of nothing. But nothing comes out of nothing. So nothing can change. Uh, we can spend the rest of the evening to discuss it, but <laughs> we will not. But it was a logical difficulty. And 
Aristotle said, well, there are three modes of being. There's actually being, non-being, and potentially being. Something can actualize out of a potential state, so to speak. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, in atoms, molecules, they're empty states. They can become actualized. It's the same idea. Giordano Bruno, 16th century monk, burned on stake in Rome. He said, the structure of reality is coincidence of matter and form, potency and act, so that being logically divided into what it is and what it can be, is physically undivided and one. So he made a connection between potentiality and wholeness. Maybe that will come back too. <clears throat> Non-empirical reality in an empirical science is an embarrassment. So uh, it's not good for the business, you know? <laughs> so the pioneers, they try to explain it away. Niels Bohr, for example, he said, we don't have any experience of things, we only have experience of our experience. And the one is not the same as the other, so just forget about it. If, if there are strange things coming out, they mean nothing. It's our experience. Whose idea what was it actually? Kant, Immanuel Kant, who said, we don't experience things, we only experience our interactions with things. So, and then <clears throat> Einstein. It is, it is fair to say that Einstein, he hated quantum physics. All his life, he tried to prove that it was wrong. He had to admit that it was very powerful in many ways, but he didn't like it. So he said, there's something wrong with it. Specifically, something is missing. We need a theory that is complete. It is a great pleasure for me to correct this giant in, in the human history <laughs> by saying what is incomplete is not the theory, what is incomplete is the visible reality because it doesn't tell us anything about what is going on in the invisible part. There is an invisible part, but non-empirical part, but that means we cannot experience it, we cannot measure it. So, is it real? Why can I say it's real? Yes, for example, the invisible virtual states of atoms and molecules, they are real because they guide empirical phenomena, like virtual states, they steer chemical reactions. There are hundreds of thousands of examples that show how the, how the empty states of molecules determine how they react, or the empty states of atoms, how they react. In a special kind of reaction called redox, where, what am I doing? Protect me against this man. I've got one too. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, there's a special kind of reactions, redox, <laughs> where <clears throat> chemicals exchange electrons and they lead to changes in magnetic properties that depend on the empty states. They can be measured or oxygen can serve your metabolism because it has invisible degenerate states. Yeah, in chemistry, being degenerate is, is something nice, actually. <laughs> so, yeah, there are other examples, but we can skip them. <clears throat> so virtual states are real. Uh, is it convincing, or would you like to say uh, no? What do you mean by the degenerate states? Degenerate. It's, a, it's kind of a technical term. Degenerate state just means there are two states that have the same energy. Why chemists call that degenerate? I don't know. It is kind of weird if you think about it. But it's a... It's a, it's a, it's a virtual 
Pardon? Degenerates, no, degenerate, degenerate state, degenerate states have the same energy. Okay. Yeah. Virtual, empty. An empty state. No energy. <laughs> it's very good, yeah, we should talk. Um, <laughs> a, an empty state has associate, associated with it an energy that is actualized when it becomes occupied. But when it's empty, the energy is not there. But to get in there, the system needs energy. Okay? So how does that relate with the degenerate state? But it doesn't. <laughs> degenerate state means there are two states in the system that have the same energy, or you need the same energy to jump into. So in other words, you have the energy, you don't know where you land, right or left or whatever. You can be a problem, I can see that already. <laughs> Virtual states can be real. And you can say, you know, molecules are guided in their actions by the waveforms of their empty states, like by inner images. Now, that concept, inner images, comes out of psychology. There is a German uh, brain scientist, Gerald Hüther. He calls inner images all that which is hidden behind the visible surface of living beings and steers their actions. In chemistry, a molecule does nothing that isn't allowed by a waveform, an inner image of a virtual state. In life, a human being does nothing that isn't allowed by an inner image in our mind. So, you know, if you like to, uh, there's an equivalence of the mental and the physical. Quantum physics is the psychology of the universe. Yeah. To the average Western mind, this is crazy. A few hundred years ago, they would have put me on a pile of, of wood, you know. Um, it's interesting if you have an employee and, and he has opinions you don't like, people come and say, you are fired. I mean, someone is thinking, oh, I wish I could really still put him in, on fire. You know, no, he's just, but you are fired, so you're out. <laughs> so <clears throat> the discovery of the quantum phenomena, that is a very important point. It signals a change of mind like a mutation of our mind. And I think it, it signals a metamorphosis of the human consciousness, a jump into the spiritual mind. That term I have to define. Spiritual mind is a mind who is not afraid to, seek, to search for truth in a non-empirical world. And even science can do that now. So, uh, in the non-empirical background of the universe. <clears throat> um, there are many consequences, but you know, I will only mention a side, like understanding evolution. Biologists love to say quantum physics has nothing to do with biology. No, the synthesis of a gene is a chemical process, you know, is a quantum process, but quantum physics has nothing to do with this. Um, and evolution, you know, life comes out of nothing. No, it doesn't come out of nothing. Evolution is adaptation of life forms to forms in the realm of the cosmic potentiality. It's only secondarily to the environment. But that's just a side. Yeah, it's that same point. So, <clears throat> uh, you see, there is this German poet, um, 
William Bush, he, he wrote a book, he sold hundreds of millions of copies. And, and he said, ist der Ruf erst ruiniert, lebt es sich ganz ungeniert. You can translate by saying, once the reputation is gone, life can be a lot of fun. So, well, he meant a person who has too many girlfriends, but, but you can apply it to scientists who, who dare to have forbidden thoughts. And it's the same consequence. So, um, Eddington. Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington. One time he realized, he said, it's, you know, when we make measurements in physics, what we measure makes sense because somehow the instruments, they are connected with the background that we know. Like, you see light dot in the night sky. It makes sense because you know about planets revolving around the sun. And he said the strange thing about atoms is we don't know the background. Atoms are your eating. Enjoy your dinner. <laughs> Atoms, they are like a brain. There is a lot of activity, but we don't know what is going on in the mind. So he said, let's think the two together, the atoms and the brain, and say the background of atoms is mind-like. Already in the 30s of last century. So he said, the stuff of the world is mind stuff. The universe is of the nature of a thought in a universal mind. <clears throat> Many other people have expressed such views recently. James Jeans, Hans Dürr, our friend, Menas Kafatos, Hans Jürgen Fischbeck, even others. So, step by step, these, these things evolve in the physics. Um, the, the physicists weren't looking for it, but they were kind of pushed over this in the direction like when you think about probability waves. There are patterns of information. Someone says information. Information is normally for some mind. Whose mind? Is it cosmic? No, stupid. Or potentiality waves. They are thought-like. Our thoughts have the nature of potentiality. My thoughts are real, but you, you don't see them. They have the potential to come out. It's exactly the definition of state of potentiality. St. Augustine already had this idea. I told this before, but he was speaking to people in Rome and he said, I just realized this is really strange. I speak to you, you are from Rome, I have to speak Latin. If you were from Greek, I would have to speak Greek, but I just realized right now the thought in me is not in Latin, not in Greek. Something completely different. It's in a state of potentiality. It is a non-empirical state. Do you want to hear the story about St. Augustine as a playboy? No, I've told you too often. You want to hear it? Yes. He was a saint, but he was also a playboy. Well, it, at the time of life when it was fun to be a playboy, he was a playboy. Big dinners, vino italiano, you know, we, girlfriends, many at the same time, the real thing. But he knew it wasn't quite right. So he had a prayer, it said, Dear God, let me be a good person, but not yet today. <laughs> it's actually a true story, a true citation. All right. Um, What did I want to say here? Oh. Yeah, you know, if there's a cosmic realm of forms that are thought like, does it mean there's a cosmic mind? Um, 
it's here I have hit something. Okay, now it doesn't. Yeah. The idea of a cosmic mind is also perennial philosophy. You know, Hegel already in the 18th, 19th century, he said, absolute spirit is a primary structure of reality. If you are proud of your thinking, think twice, because it's not your thinking, it's the thinking of the cosmic spirit in you. I don't know whether he thought he was the first, but he wasn't. The Indian sages, thousands of years ago, had this, this example, example of the water pots. They said, if you take a thousand pots, fill them with water, put them in the sun, you see the sun in each one of them, but there's only one sun. If you take a thousand people, 950 of them will have a mind, a consciousness, but there's only one consciousness, God, the cosmic consciousness. So you see uh, the same uh, ancient ideas. Yes, and whether scientists like that sort of stuff or not, you cannot avoid to admit that the way quantum physics describes the world puts it into the context of ancient spirituality. Whether you believe in this or not, it does put it in this. For example, you know, we talked about molecular wave functions, no units of mass or energy. They're just pure forms. In Aristotle's metaphysics, all things were mixtures of matter and form. There was only one pure form, God. Plotinus, he said God is the one. The world isn't the, the creation of the one, but an emanation due to a necessary flowing over of the divine. The one is all, all is out of the one. Ah, Meister Eckhart, virtual, we talked about virtual states. They are the empty states, a term of quantum chemists. Who invented it? Meister Eckhart, a medieval mystic who lived in Cologne. Um, he said, the existence of things <clears throat> in the empirical world is due to the actualization of their virtual being. Isn't that it's crazy? I mean, the, the chemists who picked this term, they, they weren't thinking of Meister Eckhart. I, th I bet you they didn't even know about him. And they came up with the same idea. And you have to say, what is going on in a human mind that something like this happens? Again, you can say, are we connected? Is quantum theory a form of mysticism? Yeah. So, when you talk about cosmic consciousness and a mind-like background, maybe being connected, um, you can ask, well, is it, do you have any proof? And you have to say, well, what do you mean with proof? I mean, if somebody feels connected, you can't measure something, can't measure the temperature of a brain and say, okay, that guy is connected, that guy, no, is not connected. There's no such thing. <clears throat> um, whether or not you are connected, you have to answer. Your mind must answer that question, okay? I can't do it for you, nobody can do it for you. You need a personal response. I can share with you a, an experience I had, and, and don't worry, I'm not going off the deep end, that um, shows me that somehow I was connected to things without knowing. Um, and it's like this. Some time ago I realized that all the ideas that I'm talking about now in connection with quantum physics existed in me when I was in my 20s. Eh, some time ago. Um, 
they didn't exist in the same way, they existed in a symbolical way. And I can prove it. Because at the time I painted, I painted the ideas that I talk about in a symbolic way. For example, cosmic spirit is thinking in us. In those days I sometimes made self-portrait. I always made it with the cosmos in my, somewhere in my face. It's the same idea. I, I had no knowledge about the Indian sages or anything. It, it's kind of weird. Um, another point, the principle of waves. In quantum physics, Schrodinger's mechanics, the world comes out of waves. It's also an ancient idea. Spanda. Kashmir Shaivism. Spanda is the wave of the ocean of consciousness without <clears throat> which there is no consciousness at all. The world is filled with waves. It's a sign of the creativity of the universe. The visible world comes out of it. This is the Indian teaching. When I was a young man, I was fascinated with the ocean, with waves. I loved waves. I was crazy. So I started to paint them. My oceans had a problem. The waves came out of the sky. Yeah, it, it was except then people started to worry about me. <laughs> Every time I paint in the ocean, the waves came. You know, this is like the boat is like a symbol for us. It's, it's a road through Spanda towards the light. Uh, sometime at the end of my 20s, I stopped doing that. I didn't even, oh, yeah, the waves could be a problem, you know. Uh, I forgot about it. My wife had these. She was pulling out one. I said, who did that? Where did you find this? And she had one after another. Every time I did waves, they came out of the sky. It's the same idea. And if you're not too critical, it's beautiful. So, well, um, yes, yeah, crazy. <laughs> Some of my friends said, you know, you should see a doctor. And, but my wife liked it, so I said, you go, you just go. So, well. <clears throat> Yeah. Some of these are really, I cannot believe I did this. And a final example, in this life, if you want to be creative, you have to leave the empirical world in your thinking. If you are a flower, it means if you want to bloom, you have to leave the pot. This flower did, and it is blooming. So, <clears throat> I've said quantum theory is a form of mysticism. Mysticism used to be a method to explore the world. Listen to Plotinus when he says, often when I wake up out of myself, out of my body to myself, and step out of the otherness into myself, I behold the most wonderful beauty. It is then that I lift myself above all the perceptible. When a student asked <clears throat> Jakob Böhme, the, the German mystic, where he could find God, the master answered, Son, when you can throw yourself into that where there is no, no creation, no creative dwelling, then you shall hear what God has to say. <clears throat> when the student then said, where is this that where I can, I can hear God? The master said, it is in you, my son. God hears and sees through you, speaks in you and whispers to your spirit. And your spirit hears his voice. So, <clears throat> um, 
How can you be sure that your mind is a spiritual mind? Because deep inside it, you can hear that the cosmic spirit is whispering in you. Bajavid Bestami was a Muslim mystic in the ninth century. He said, for 30 years, I went about searching for God. When after that time, I opened my eyes, I discovered that it was God who was searching for me. Your inner potential is like that. For many decades, you may look for it and see what it might be. And then when you wake up, you see it has been looking for you. When that happens, the ideas will begin to flow into your mind, which has become a spiritual mind. Good books need good friends. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>